Okay, so it's it's yeah uh, five twenty. Uh, yeah, I, I will start. Um, yes, yeah, thank you to the hosts first of all for having me. It's it's a uh, it's an honor, and uh, yeah, I will uh, present my PhD thesis um, at the University of Vienna. I'm finishing my third year now, so yeah, I'm kind of in the middle or mid end of this uh, uh, research project and my research question was in the beginning actually a very simple question namely could it be that there are gothic loanwords in hungarian that we might have overlooked during the process of uh, finding uh, loanwords and uh, so uh, before i start i just want to quickly uh, kind of illustrate the, the broader context of my thesis so there is there is this uh, field that Malcolm Ross suggests in this uh, handbook, handbook of historical linguistics in 2020. He calls it narrative historical linguistics. And I really like the term and the concept, how he describes it. It makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I would like to see my thesis kind of in this uh, spirit. So so what, what is narrative historical linguistics? It's the intersection of, well, uh, Ross says these four, actually four areas, archaeology, genetics, history, and uh, linguistics and like anyone who worked on historical linguistics knows that these four they they have a they have a thorough like interplay and you cannot do one without the other so it kind of makes sense to suggest this this uh, interdisciplinary uh, field and and call it like like this like narrative historical linguistics and I I have added two points that aren't mentioned by Ross actually namely data science and computer science because I think. Uh, all of these four, they they are to some degree based on on data that we elicit in one way or another, and we have to analyze it uh, most of the time manually. But uh, I think we should we should uh, try to yeah also see how far we can go with uh, with computational models if we can discover some patterns that we maybe didn't discover so far uh, with our manual uh, methods. Okay, so yeah, and what I wanted to say is I put a little red dot here. This is how intuitively I would I would locate in this hexagon. I would locate my own research um, here because it's it's somewhere between like linguistics and computer science and uh, data science, and it tilts less towards history. But I would say most of the approaches of computational historical linguistics. To, uh, tilt more towards data science and computer science. There are not so many linguists who work on these computational models. So I think most of the research is somewhere here close to data science and computer science. I'm a bit more on the right side because I myself, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a, I'm a Euralist actually. So uh, in my field, we, have, we are working with traditional methods and there are not so many computational approaches uh, yet. Um, yeah, so this, that was the broader context, and now, and now to go, get a bit narrower and describe this general idea of uh, historical linguistics and old borrowings. So um, this is uh, kind of a sketch to, to visualize what's going on with old borrowings. You have here in the uh, left corner, uh, in the bottom left corner, like the modern uh, L1. L1 is the recipient language. And the modern L2 would be a donor language. And these the words, they can transfer from the donor language to the recipient language from L2 to L1. And, and when this transition happens, there are sound sub substitutions and other adaptations also. Um, yeah, and and so this is if you if you if you look at, at borrowing from a from a synchronic point of view, but uh, because I want to look for old borrowings, uh, we have to look at it from a diachronic point of view. So on top of these sound substitutions, we have to add sound changes as well. And this complicates stuff a bit. And what I've seen uh, in those computational approaches is a tendency to uh, disregard these uh, sound changes. So if you try to detect borrowings, you just uh, align the donor word and you align the you align the donor word with the recipient word and then you quantitatively you look like okay which sounds which sound corresponds to which sound but there is actually on 
a few languages, uh, there is a thorough etymological research, and there is a lot of data that we can use uh, about the historic changes uh, to make the predictions more uh, precise. So I added here uh, on the right side the proto L2 and the proto L1. And uh, now the tricky thing is that when we reconstruct these languages, we have these uh, corners. We have we know how the language sounded now. We know we can more or less reconstruct how it used to sound. But the substitutions, they could have happened during any stage in between. And as we know, uh, sound changes, they usually uh, sounds change gradually. So if you if you have, a, a let's say, a F in your modern language and you have a P in your proto language, you know that during some point there the p first turned into a f so so you can you can uh, in the, those sound substitutions you can use sounds uh, that don't appear in your proto language you, these kind of in between stages so this makes it sort of even more complex but um, but this model exists and it works and for example for Finnish it has been used and there is a there is a huge amount of literature about pre-Germanic, proto-Germanic, uh, and all the way up to to, uh, to modern day German, like um, uh, research about those loan words in, in Finnish and at what stages they appeared. And and if you look uh, into it uh, thoroughly, you will see that there are clusters and, and patterns, how those sounds uh, were substituted up to a degree that you can, even from those sound substitutions, you will be able to say something about the donor language which you otherwise wouldn't be able to but yeah this is just to illustrate that this is a this is an existing framework and it and it works um but it's mostly almost exclusively used uh for uh manual or traditional etymological research especially uh yeah loan word research because there's so many things uh, going on um, that it's hard to to formalize it so that the computer can handle it. But on the other hand, I'm thinking that it's still it's still regular in a way. So there should be a way to 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 have an algorithm that can kind of handle this and and that can check if something is a loan word or it isn't. So so this is my concrete example. I worked with um, Hungarian and and. Uh, yeah so yeah so this this is first to to just to sketch a little bit what's going on with hungarian so hungarian is a uralic language right and uh, you can reconstruct proto uralic uh, with the help of the other finno ugric languages and it's estimated that uh, proto uralic was spoken around 3000 uh, before common era and uh, so this is one stage that we can reconstruct we have present day hungarian uh, i wrote there 2006 because the word list i used is from a dictionary from that year um and then you know that you have uh you have stages of sound changes in between <clears throat> but um <clears throat> but you those sound changes they don't really point to a to a concrete uh proto language anymore it's just a, that's why i painted these kind of waves it's like a flow and you don't know which sounds changed when some sounds might have stasis they don't change for a long time and then all of a sudden they change um rapidly one after another so uh, this one is hard to model but it's not impossible and in fact it has been done so for example proto indo iranian uh, loanwords are very well researched in proto uralic um there uh, was a dissertation for, uh, from Samsa Holopainen in 2019. So we know a fair amount of these. Then uh, there is a, a also a renowned book that came out recently by uh, Andras Schronatas a few years ago. Um, it's called West Old Turkic and it, it, it describes this kind of pre Chuvash type Turkic loan words. He calls it West Old Turkic. Uh, yeah, somewhere between like 1000 BC and 400 C. And there you can also find like regular substitution patterns. But note that the, these they weren't loaned into Proto Uralic anymore, but they were loaned into a stage of the language that we can only 
roughly estimate because we have only these two points, Hungarian and Proto-Uralic. And it goes on like a thousand C. There, there were a lot of Germanic and, and Slavic loanwords. I think there are around like 1,000 German borrowings in, in Hungarian. They're all from the, from the Middle Ages. So rather old, yeah. Um, and, and of course, uh, today you have these English loanwords in Hungarian also. I feel like they're under research. I didn't find a lot of literature about them. But they are kind of obvious, like internet or like these kind of, especially like tech, technical terms, uh, neologisms, so on and so forth. So yeah, this is just a little bit to sketch like the situation of Hungarian because that's what I'm researching. Um, yeah, this is another picture I just put in so you can kind of locate Hungarian is here. This is proto uralic This is the uh the years before present and here you can kind of see when it split up from its sister languages so um so yeah proto-uralic was here like 3000 bc yeah um yeah this is just a little bit to, yeah, for orientation or or for confusion i hope not for confusion but yeah and okay and so this is i, I have eight more minutes to go I, I hope I, I get to the end but so this is my research question now it's it's could it be that that, that there are gothic loan words loaned into Hungarian and we have just overlooked them and uh, so there is a well a useful corpus uh, of like a few thousand words uh, of uh, gothic um, that you can use in form of a database and yeah and so the task would be now to check if 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 there is an algorithm that could find any connections and the the tricky part is that you can't just you can't just go and align these two because um there because there are two steps so one step is is the sound change and we can extract this information about sound change from etymological dictionaries so um so we can try to make predictions into the past how these hungarian words might have sounded if they they are old so you create sort of a pseudo pseudo reconstruction pseudo proto forms and here on the other side you try to predict somehow how might have gothic words been adapted to this uh obscure stage of pre-hungarian it's a uh, yeah it's it's a hard thing to do but but uh, linguists are doing this historical linguists are doing it and they're doing it in a manual way so uh if there is a if there is a blueprint for doing it in a manual way there should be a blueprint also to uh to approach it from a computational uh, perspective or or at least help uh help the manual methods with this okay so um i have uh, five more minutes to go and so i uh, I tried to write this uh, Python package. It's called LonePy, um, and it consists of, of uh, three uh, modules. I'm afraid I, I won't have time to show them anymore. Uh, maybe in the in the question session or or in the gather session. But um, I can summarize that this reconstructor module it does exactly this: that it ex extracts the data from an etymological dictionary and it tries to predict how Hungarian words where we don't know if they are old, but if we suppose that they are old, how they would have sound based on this knowledge that we have about sound changes. So that's the reconstructor module. And the adapter module is, uh, is predicting how sounds would have most likely been substituted in this um, proto language and how their phonotactics would have been uh, substituted. So uh so these are two basically two um, pre prediction prediction models actually we have to say and um so i'm going to stick to these two because this third uh, module it's kind of i won't have time to describe it unfortunately i think and it's kind of still work in progress so so i'm focusing on on the phonology for today um it, it's so, up to you if you want to uh describe it then it's just no, but a li little less questions yeah no but i'm actually looking very much forward to, to the questions because i really appreciate them always so 
Um, yeah. Uh, so so okay. So so I made this reconstructor thing, and as said, I'm not a computer scientist, uh, but I still tried to look into it because, as I said in the beginning, it's an interdisciplinary field, so you can't really ignore these other fields. So you ha have to at least try, I think. And so I I wrote this package and this reconstructor. The reconstructor, in fact, it's uh, I think it's sort of a naive approach to to actually to machine learning. It it imitates it imitates the the workflow that a human would do, and it extracts exactly the information that a human uh, lexicographer would extract from etymological data. But actually, now I looked into it, and there are machine learning approaches that perform way better than this. Um, and it could be that I will that at some point I could replace this approach with the with the more sophisticated machine learning approach. But the but the thing is that the crucial thing is that this is like a framework. It can even be a theoretical framework only. And if you have a better reconstructor, you can just plug it in, and that's it. And uh, so this is a, an ROC curve. I I wanted to describe it more in detail, but yeah, I kind of screw, screwed up the timing. But the point is that um, yeah, the false positive rate is quite high, and the true positive rate is like rather low. And yeah, machine learning approaches perform a bit better, but it's still okay for the for the goals that I had. So maybe I'm going to stick to this. Let's see. And then the other one was this adapter, which performed better. And this one I tested with um, actually with um, Maori loan words into English, <clears throat> and I, I got a I got a list of 65 Maori loan words in English, and. Uh, and I did this cross validation. So I isolated one word and extracted the information from the other uh, 64 words and then tried to predict this one word. And th this is the ROC curve. So this false positive rate, 100% means 1,000 false positives. So somewhere around 200 false positives, it, it gets like 60%, right? I don't know if 200, if that's a lot or a little uh, compared to other approaches, but there is not a lot out there. I think this is, it's kind of pioneering work. So I have the feeling that like any result is a, is a good start. And then from there on, you can, you can improve. But so, yeah, so with this adapter thing, I was quite happy and yeah. So Lone Finder, it's still work in progress, but uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I have two, two more minutes. So I think I, I will skip this part uh, so so that I don't cause more uh, confusion, especially because here I didn't I didn't visualize the results yet. And I don't know how much sense it makes to talk about it uh, yeah, in, in detail before I do. So um, yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, feel free to uh, find me on Twitter. I'm using this handle. I'm tweeting every day. Sometimes I tweet updates about how my project is going. Sometimes I'm just bullshitting. And yeah, and I'm really looking forward for your questions, uh, ideas, uh, comments, discussion, maybe things that I overlooked, maybe like papers who, who do something like this, but in a more sophisticated, like machine learning kind of way. Um, I realized there is like a lot of things out there, but sometimes often actually like researchers, they are not aware that like someone else did something similar already. And uh, Sometimes a bit confusing, but there is stuff out there, but it's sometimes hard to find. And yeah, you know, I'm I'm trying to implement that also in the knowledge, or at least quote them, or yeah. So I appreciate any any kind of comment or maybe even flaw that I like overlooked or anything. Yeah, but thanks for your attention. In any case. Yeah.